we are joined by Harsh Mariwala, the chairman of Marico. Marico is one of the largest homegrown consumer product companies with blockbuster brands like Parachute and Safola in its portfolio. We are speaking to Harsh because he has a new book coming out in a few days. It's called Harsh Reality and published by Penguin Random House. It's a breezy account of the transformation of a family-owned commodity business to a publicly owned and professionally managed almost a billion dollar marketing driven FMCG giant with a global footprint. The book also features fascinating family drama and intense David versus Goliath boardroom battles. It is the story of Harsh, the entrepreneur, who had to reboot himself pretty and pretty and, and start pretty much afresh at least half a dozen times by my reckoning. Harsh is also a rare entrepreneur in India who knows the art of letting go. Despite its origins as a family-owned company, Marico is today professionally managed uh, with Harsh uh, stepping aside from most day-to-day -day executive functions. Welcome to the Business Line podcast, Harsh, and uh, congratulations on the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivek, and nice uh, speaking to you. Um, let me start by asking you about uh, the family name itself, the Mariwala name. I don't think it's a surname that one would uh, often encounter among people from Kutch, <laughs> where your family is. Yes, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if you look at uh, any, any directory in, say, Bombay or anywhere else, you will hardly find any Mariwala except my relatives. There are there have been few other Mariwalas, but uh, very handful. So it's an unusual name. And it has nothing to do with Kutch, but it has to do with uh, the business my uh, grandfather started in black pepper. Mm -hmm. And in Gujarati, black pepper is known as Mari. Uh, so, and when you start a business and you get associated with in the society, then Wala is somebody who is connected to that uh, so it, we are closely connected to Black Pepper and that's how the name Mariwala came in. Mm -hmm. And earlier, prior to that, the surname was Merchant. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were so many merchants. Maybe my grandfather thought that Mariwala is a better name because it is, uh, at least it is giving a hint in terms of what is, what is the business at that point of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Harsh, tell us about uh, the origins of the of the business that uh, your 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 grand grandparents started, uh, and it is quite a well known company, um, Bombay Oil. Tell us about how it came to be formed. So the business started uh, through a trading group by my grandfather, and then my father joined the business. At that time, we were trading mainly in black pepper and copra, and other spices. And we were doing cleaning and grading of pepper and in mainly in Kerala mm -hmm. and also exporting pepper. And we had built a good name in terms of our quality and assurance and trust and reliability. So we were one of the leading exporters of black pepper at that time. Mm -hmm. And when my father uh, who was the first person from the uh, next generation, that is, he was, he was the eldest amongst uh, the children, he took a big step in converting the business from trading to manufacturing. So he looked at the raw materials we were, uh, we were exporting, like black pepper, and from that we went into uh, what is known as the oleoresins or spices, which is extracts of spices, which is exported to developed markets instead of exporting spices. And then we went into copra crushing and went to refining of edible oils and also making chemicals from oil. Mm -hmm. So he is the one who brought in the transition from, from trading to manufacturing. That's how Bombay Oil Industries was formed in the year 47. Mm -hmm. And then on, uh, you know, there were, as I said, there were four uh, factories in uh, three in Bombay, one in Kerala. And he also acquired a company in, in Gujarat, uh, manufacturing Vanaspati. So I think he was the one who converted the business from trading to manufacturing. And that's how... When I joined the business, uh, and again, I was the first person from the next generation, I, I joined Bombay Oil Industries at that time, the manufacturing part of the family. Which, you know. which, which, which year uh, did you officially join business? So I joined uh, uh, business in the year 71. Okay. At the uh, young age of 20. 20. Ha Hush, yeah. I'm, I'm personally fascinated by Indian business history. Um, for a lot of our young listeners... Uh, tell us about those times, you know, at, at the age of 20, uh, uh, 
when you entered uh, the family business what was yeah. the business landscape like um, uh, you know especially uh, the business of spices and oil trading yeah. and you know it was a, uh, we hear about the extortionate tax rates and yes. uh, it was said that you know uh, india was, was probably the hardest country to do business in yes so in so your yeah. environment yeah uh, yeah uh, did you ever think of not being an entrepreneur in those <laughs> so okay multiple questions you asked what is the environment at that time and as you rightly put it it uh, it was highly regulated and uh, i think most businesses needed a uh, a license to manufacture and not only license to start manufacturing but uh, uh, if you had a manufacturing capacity of say 100 tons you could not manufacture beyond 110 tons so you know there were other regulations which uh, inhibited uh, you to uh, grow Uh, and again for for whatever reason if your productivity increased your production increased beyond the license capacity you have to go back to the government for increasing the capacity so the need to get permissions from the government uh, to because of tight regulations was really inhibiting the growth of uh, businesses so i think that was one uh, but separately i think as entrepreneurs uh, I, you want to be an entrepreneur I, i agree that the tax rates were very high and at one stage i mean you were looking at 90% plus tax income tax and wealth tax and rates combined mm-hmm. but uh, as businessmen uh, you i think your your burning desire to build a business overcomes all the other shall i say regulatory issues as well as the tax hurdles you know mm-hmm. and uh, so yes it was difficult uh the tax rates were high but in spite of that i don't think i ever said that i don't want to join the business i don't think i ever said that i want to work for somebody else because the need for autonomy and the need to create a stamp of your own in terms of the business you built mm-hmm. is very high amongst entrepreneurs you know mm-hmm. and they hope that the environment will change which changed over a period of time and now it's much much easier to do business compared to the times uh, when i started mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in your book uh, reading your book it seems that uh, you know you've sought out mentors outside of family and community circles uh, very early you know uh, even even when you were cutting your teeth as a sort of uh, you know management trainee at large at the bombay oil yeah. why did, why did you do that um, and uh, how did you find, find professor ramcharan as as your mentor and who also happens to be the co narrator of this book so uh, you know when i joined the business it was a typically family managed uh, business located in the heart of commodity markets in masjid bandar in bombay which is a very very crowded locality mm-hmm. um in transport area very dirty locality lot of hand carts lorries no parking place for cars so it was tough really to enter the office also and in a very dirty kind of surrounding mm-hmm. so and then it was a completely family managed organization there were no professionals so the family was there which comprised of my father and three of his brothers and then uh, there were all the family relatives or acquaintances who were helping the family run the business so at one level you know it was the fact that there were no professional it was typically family managed company and all the key decisions were taken by the family and you know i envisaged uh, creating a fast moving consumer goods business which required you need to to need to attract very good talent whether it's in marketing or in hr or in or in sales and uh, one was not able to attract talent because of, because of the location in masjid bandar the fact that it was perceived to be a family managed organization so many family members in the business so i had to work with outside professionals who were uh, who were functional experts Mm-hmm. and that's how i started working with three four of them and meeting them sometimes in the evening sometimes night because they were busy doing a day job uh, because i had to set up all the systems basic systems of hr sales marketing mm-hmm. uh, business, you know and i think the whole thing transformed over a period of time but uh, individual interactions with thought leaders 
has really helped me in terms of uh, improving my own understanding of the business, teaching me a lot because I just did my commerce graduation. I didn't even do my uh, MBA or anything like that. So I was also going through a lot of learning curve. And I think these interactions helped me both. One is in my own learning and also implementing uh, all the systems, processes in the organization, which really helped in terms of growing the business. But uh, coming and to a specific question yeah, about Ram Charan, yes, yes. how did I meet him? So I think over a period of time when uh, the business grew, we we realized that we needed to work with some consultants who are really top class in terms of at a global level and uh, consultant who could help us uh, arrive at our vision, help us look at the strategy, uh, project our business over a period of time. And uh, in that search, I, I was interacting with some other family uh, professionals, uh, family friends who are professionals. So somebody in Levers whom uh, the family knew uh, suggested uh, Ram Chan's name. And it took me some time to convince him. Uh, I had to send a lot of uh, literature uh, in terms of what we were doing, what we intended doing, and then uh, get him to India. Mm -hmm. And finally, that happened. And we really clicked well in terms of uh, personal chemistry, in terms of uh, uh, adding value. So that's, the, that's how I started working. So it was through a process of, shall I say, identification through my own networks and then taking it further in terms of establishing a close relationship with him. Tell, tell us about the story of your uh, what uh, late night trips or early morning trips to Ahmedabad <laughs> to meet a certain uh, yeah. I am Ahmedabad professor. Yes. Yeah. So the professor's name uh, was uh, Dr. Labdi Bhandari. He was heading the marketing uh, faculty in I am Ahmedabad. Mm -hmm. And again, I had identified through friends who was a good marketing brain. And but he made it very clear to me that I have a full day job and I can't I can't work with you during the day. I can't come to Bombay, so you'll have to come to Ahmedabad uh, late evening. And we would start at about nine in the evening and go up to three four in the morning, uh, discuss whatever key issues we had to discuss in the area of marketing. And then I would come back in the morning flight. So multiple times I have done those those night trips, evening trips, and coming back next morning from Ahmedabad. Primarily because he was very busy, and you know, I had to, I had to adjust myself to his, his, his timings. You know, uh, Harshman, you did decide to create a core of professional managers inside uh, what was a very, very traditional family business setup. What, what was your sales pitch to the talent that you were trying to attract? Was it money alone? Paying you, you, you mentioned in your book that yeah. uh, you paid top dollars, or what, what the market rate then was? Yeah, yeah. So I think in multiple, you know, in the initial stages, it was Bombay Oil Industries. So I used to, uh, many times, you know, when I would call people to the office, they would just not turn up, you know, they would run away before entering the office because it was so crowded, you know, mm -hmm. and was so dirty. So then I had to change tax and I, I used to meet them at the Wellington Club, which is a prestigious club in Bombay. And uh, at least meet them once, twice uh, and mentally prepare them that this is uh, what the office is. Uh, and over a period of time, we will try our utmost to shift the office. So that was, at that time, the big pitch was, okay, it's uh, it's perceived to be a family managed, but I'm the one who you will report to. And the office premises and that we are setting up a business which uh, for which I need your help. And uh, you will work directly with me. But as the business grew and as the, the business of consumer products in Bombay Oil got shifted to Marico, that gave me a great opportunity to to work on what we call the employee value proposition at that time. Mm -hmm. And we said that what kind of talent you require, what kind of culture you require to succeed in FMC business is very, very crucial for us to identify. So we identified values like openness, trust, empowering, because that was a key differentiator compared to many other multinational corporations where a lot of permission, a lot of decisions were taken by the headquarters located in some other countries, mostly in UK or US. And here everything was done at our own end. So we said that you learn a lot if you work with us compared to MNC. Uh, it's, it's, we also trying to instill the pride that it's an Indian company you're working for. So a combination of cultural values of openness, trust, risk-taking, empowerment, being an Indian company played a very important role in attracting talent, you know, but one had to proactively deal with it. And, you know, me saying that would not have 
So I had to recruit very good HR person. The first person I recruited when I started Marico was the head of HR, you know, and I think that he was able to convince them because he was convinced himself after discussing with me. So with his networks, he was able to convince others to join that we are here to create future uh, FMCG company, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Harsh, almost 80% of Indian businesses are, are family owned, perhaps even more. Um, and intergenerational transition without peers seems to be the biggest challenge for them. Uh, yeah. How did you deal with it uh, when uh, you demerged the consumer business from Bombay Oil yeah, and then yeah. later when Marico was formed and then now yeah. when you yeah. decided to step aside? So you're absolutely right that uh, when the next generation joins the family business, they come up with their own set of uh, thinking, their own set of ambitions. They have studied differently compared to their parents or uncles. And they are big change agents in any organization. And many a times if that change is not handled properly, it can lead to either the business breaking up or business getting divided or smooth transition not happening. And I think first 10, 15 years, I was the first only person 10 years or so uh, from the next generation who owned the business. But then three, four of my cousins joined business. So it was very important for me to, to drive change through consensus building, you know, because if I had, uh, if I had taken a certain stance and, you know, if it had not been agreed by other family members, it would have led to some differences of opinion and that itself would have led to conflicts and I would have still been managing conflicts because you've seen in many family managed organizations, the conflicts go on for not only one decade, but two, three, four decades, you know. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to avoid that. And I think uh, for that, you require a lot of patience. Uh, you need to build consensus. And if need be, you need to have some somebody who's trusted by the family to act as some, some sort of mediator. So you have to do it gradually. You can't uh, though you may be convinced that this is the only way to move forward, you have to have a lot of patience. And, you know, uh, there has to be some, some time you have to go on. Uh, but I think it, to me, it, it took almost two to three years to, to make that happen, you know. And, but looking back, it was fully worth uh, investing those efforts uh, at that time. Otherwise, I would have been struggling managing family dynamics uh, all my life, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did the how did the iconic blue parachute bottle come to become uh, uh, the category definer for coconut oils in India? You know, there seems to be a lot of uh, quirky experiments that you have done. Some even <laughs> featuring rats. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, what did you do? So I think uh, the blue bottle was I think associated with sky. You know, blue sky. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think uh, maybe my favorite color is blue. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it just happened. Uh, we were also packing at that time coconut oil in, in bulk, like 15 liter tins and also in uh, in one liter tins, you know. And at that time it was blue and I thought I'll continue, continue that blue color. And separately, a lot of advice was given to me at that time that parachute, why parachute? Parachute is not the right brand name for a coconut oil, you know. But I thought it is, uh, I mean, it's okay to continue. I didn't have any other option. And the word parachute came in because of the fact that, you know, those days, in World War days, there was, uh, the parachute was new. Uh, it was used to, you know, to land, you know, from the skies. So, so I think because it was new, it had some unique uh, kind of, a, uh, it was something new. So the family had decided to name the coconut oil parachute, but mainly it was sold in big tins. I decided to continue uh, continue uh, using that brand name as well as the color. And looking back, it has been the right decision because we have grown. Uh, coming Then we saw an opportunity of converting the whole market. We launched the product in tins in small packs, 200 ml, 500 ml. And then we said that, can we convert the market from tin to plastic? And that's how the plastic bottles came in. And, you know, I think all the experiments with rat biting and all came in. So I think that is in the history of our parachute uh, Packaging, which has played a very important role in driving our growth from virtually a zero percent market share, we over a period of 10 15 years became clear market leaders, you know, in a very large category. Yeah, those uh, uh, tin packs were really painful, you know. I remember having cut my fingers in New yeah, yeah. as a child, especially in North India, 
yes it freezes you know where you have to dig true. your fingers in and and true, true. so we uh, you are absolutely right it was not consumer friendly it was not uh, it didn't look good uh, it was more expensive compared to a plastic so it made sense the in the sense to shift to plastic but there were as, as, as i mentioned earlier a lot of trade related issues and that's what uh, we overcame over a period of time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and uh, why did it necessitate the experiment to you know put the tin uh, uh, the bottle inside a cage with rats <laughs> so you know when we went to the trade and when you when you were launching something new i think is important to check with the trade what is the reaction you know mm-hmm. so when before launching coconut oil plastics we wanted to check with consumers which is the most important and also with the trade because they are intermediate you know and the consumers preferred that coconut oil plastics because it made sense from the part of your convenience attraction but when you went to trade they said that uh, there is a lot of rat biting t- which takes place in plastic bottles which has coconut oil you know and because somebody else had launched a product like that a few years back which uh, which are not only really led to uh, product getting uh, spilled in the shop but the shop also getting spoiled because all the oil gets spilled so there was huge trade resistance and we went back to the drawing board and we told the packaging developer that you design a bottle where the rat will find it difficult to get a grip and told our packaging department to ensure that not a single drop of oil is on the outer surface of the bottle so the rat cannot smell that there is coconut oil in in in, in the plastic bottle and we wanted to test out you know whether it is it is working to our satisfaction that's how we put a few bottles in the rat cage and kept it for overnight and saw that no damage done and we were uh, we were actually quite safe from rats and that gave us a lot of confidence in terms and of you had to and you had to take take around the pictures and show them to distribute. yeah because that's the best proof you know mm-hmm. not only to uh, the trade but to our own uh, field force you know mm-hmm. if i show that this is something which we have done then they also uh, go in the marketplace very very confident in terms of uh, uh, talking to the trade so the confidence level of our own field force increased dramatically when they saw those pictures and they were also able to show those pictures to the to the trade and i think what i'm trying to say is you know you innovate something in packaging but the execution also plays a very important role and you have to uh, ensure that the execution is actually leading in making innovation far more successful today of course you can tweet it out yes share the, share the picture picture on yes Twitter. yeah um, harsh moving on to uh, the the other big moment in marico's life you know which was the listing in 1996 um the listing happened uh, during a bear run in in, in the stock markets uh, and also in the back backdrop of a family split where uh, uh, you, you had to uh, uh, hand out a big payout to your family members and uh, uh, uh. you know when you wanted to take control of the company uh. you were pretty much forced into going going public uh. right uh. Um, did it did, did it add to the family fishers and uh, was it easy to have a single minded focus on creating a business at the cost of uh, upsetting your own kith and kin so as you rightly put it i had to pay money to my cousins and if i was not able to pay then i would have lost the control of the company so i did not have any escape button i had to go public or i had to sell a part of the stake to a private equity player mm-hmm. and um, at the same time manage the existing business so it was tough but there was no other option but to do this you know if you're not been able to do then we would have i would have lost the control of the company so i think it was a great learning curve because you know one and a half two years we were not able to we were not able to uh, go public but finally we said that we have a strong story and we went public at a high premium and that succeeded and that gave a very uh, strong confidence to me and my team mm-hmm. and i don't regret going public you know because it's uh, it has benefits it could be some people may not like going public in terms of quarterly pressures performance pressures and you always in in the limelight um, by external shareholders governance also plays a very important role but to me i have looked at all that from a opportunity point of view that it, it has helped us a lot you know so looking back i think uh, going public has been a though it happened out of sheer uh, i mean i had to do it 
um, but uh, it's been a good move you know i'm happy that you went public mm-hmm. and what about your relationship with your cousins uh, you know after the payout uh, how 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 was how how are your personal <laughs> relationships and so i mean relationships? when you when anything like that happens the separation there is some there is some friction there is some strained relation but i think over a period of time it it mends you know and i think now we are back to normal though financially we are not we are not together except one of my uncles and his sons but otherwise mm-hmm. it's uh, it's back to normal in terms of uh, relationships now mm-hmm. yeah uh, uh, one of the most fascinating accounts in your book uh, is the one about the existential battle with uh, hindustan lever limited or hll Uh, you know when the when the chairman of hll kk dadi said uh, dialed up with a you know sell out or i'll finish you off kind of threat uh-huh. um, were you not tempted to take a generous offer from hll the you know big daddy the 800 pound uh-huh. gorilla of fmcg business in india and you know after all this was a this was a commodity oriented business and uh, india at that time th- th- this would have been in the in the in the mid 90s correct correct you know uh, which is when india had opened up and you know india was buzzing at that time with new business yeah. opportunities in several sunrise sector so weren't you yes. not tempted to take the money and and do something start <laughs> fresh again so i think you have to go, go back to what are your entrepreneurial dreams you know there are some people who want to tell, tell, tell us also a little bit of background about this keki dadi se phone call why <laughs> okay let me just start with what i started and then i'll come to that sure. you know There are different types of entrepreneurs. There are some entrepreneurs who build a business and they sell it, mm-hmm. and they start another business. So they are hunters, like you know, you've seen this Paras Pharma. They they built Paras, they sold it. Now they build the other company, Vini Cosmetics. Again, sold it or at least diluted it. They will sell it, and so they get that kind of. I'm more a farmer kind of entrepreneur where I look at a really long term um, continuity of business, including perpetuity. So. and money uh, it does not uh, attract me you know you need your basics in terms of some degree of monetary um, needs but beyond that you know i, I don't think I, my lifestyle has changed from what it was uh, compared to what i uh, i was maybe 20 or 30 years back so i think those but to me it was creating a strong business and sustaining it and and leading it from a perpetual basis so i was not shall i say i was not tempted by those uh, offers you know now uh, you want me to ask what i mean the key thing is uh, you know they were keen they had brought this tata nihar and they had bought um, uh, they bought one more coco care brand uh, in coconut oil segment so they had some presence in that segment and they wanted to become a clear market leader and that's how they wanted to uh, to buy us over it's uh, i mean we were approached uh, through some other uh, agents and you know bankers in terms of why did you sell out you will you will regret if you don't sell out this not only were as you said it's a gorilla but i was very clear that i don't want to sell you know mm-hmm. uh, so i think that's the background and then one fine day mr dadi said for me i had never met him prior to that and tried to convince me to sell but i was very clear i i don't want to sell You know, sensing so, your uh, intent to dig in, dig in your heels, uh, you you recount that your friend Uday Kota asked you to go and meet uh, Karsan Bhai Patel in Ahmedabad. Yeah, because uh, you know Nima at that time was fighting a battle with uh, Lever, then I think you always want to know, okay, your your enemy's enemy is your best friend. They say, you know, mm-hmm. so can you learn from them? So I went, especially I flew down to Ahmedabad for. for a day morning evening mm-hmm. i met him and then he gave me a lot of shallas support saying that no no we have to protect indian indian brands indian businesses uh, don't give up like that uh, so i think that meeting at least if not anything else it helped me build my own confidence that i can take them on you know mm-hmm. and uh, it so happened that uh, you know you turned the tables on hll you ended up buying hll's uh, nihar brand instead of selling out yeah because we took uh, i mean we were very clear that you know we were a very strong brand and we can take them on we improved uh, in the area of our physical distribution role distribution in product quality we had an emotional advertising to appeal to our existing users mm-hmm. so all net net i'm saying that we were quite confident that we will not 
get impacted. So they launched the product two, three times and spent a lot of money in, in marketing, advertising, through pricing. They were able to get some share, but not at our cost. You know? It came uh, from other weaker players, you know. And at some stage, uh, it started, they started losing interest because that to the time when Unilever started um, getting into more and more Hindustan liver shoes, you know. So at that time, hair oiling is not a is not a global category for them, Unilever. So they started losing interest. And their market share fell down from 12% to something like 7 8%. And that time I I used to meet that senior leadership team, which had got changed, and told them that why are you, I mean, you're losing share, not investing. Why don't you sell it off? And then they I mean, they didn't sell it off to me, but they put the brand on uh, through a bidding auction in which we were aggressive and we acquired that brand. Yeah, did you manage to speak to Dadi Set after that, after you bought Nihar? So, no, no, no. After that, I, I think by then he had shifted to London and he was based in, in UK, you know. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I met him after that, but not discussed. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't discuss the, the no, phone no. call? No, no, no. no. And, I and you discussed. buying their business? No, 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 no. Okay. No, by then, yeah, Mr. Arish Manwani, Vindi Banga had come in, you know, so I was, I mean, I was interacting with them. Yeah, but 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 that uh, that episode seems to have uh, kindled the animal spirits of Mariko, if I may say. Uh, you you recount how there there was a war room created, and you know, like uh, war chants, like Har Har Mahadev. You know, people used mm. to swear on parachute parachute ki kasam. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so the business got recharged, and uh, yes. you redoubled your efforts at building a better distribution network. Uh, and not ceding ground to any of the HLL brands at any cost. Did that help? Uh, that, did, did I that think so. It, first of all, it it uh, it just re rekindled, as you, as you rightly put it, the animal spirits. It gave us huge confidence in the marketplace because by then we were a public company. So, and when they we bought their brand, it was a huge, shall I say, source of joy, whatever uh, feel good factor with the organization. So definitely our our overall confidence increased uh, through that uh, that experience. You know, when when did the idea of succession planning first come to your mind? When did you actively start thinking about succession planning? So, I mean, as an entrepreneur who is who always wants to build a business from a perpetual deep angle, it's important that you think about succession planning, but because I think it is there should be system not only for the top but the next one or two levels also. And um, one doesn't know what will happen, you know, in terms of your own health or whatever is your own capability. So you always think that okay, uh, who could be my successor? Could there be an internal person? What should I do? When should I step down? When should the successor come in? So that's something which has been occupying. Uh, my thoughts uh, for some time and then also the board also plays an important role in driving such discussions of succession planning mm -hmm. so it's taken as a as a as a subject at the board level and retreats and all not only for me but one level lower also mm -hmm. so you you stepped down uh, as the managing director in 2015 i think 2014 yeah 2014 yeah uh, and and instead of instead of say a family member in a family business why did you go for a professional ceo like uh, sagata gupta so uh, i mean he approached me and said that okay can i become the managing director uh, i otherwise i can get some other job it's my desire to to be the managing director mm -hmm. uh, so i discussed with the board and we felt that yes he is he's been with the organization for more than 10 years or so and he's shown good signs of building the organization and he can uh, i think he can step into my shoes mm -hmm. so why not family or 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 is he keeping the seat warm for another mariwala <laughs> no no not like that i think the organization interests come first you know and my son had worked in mariko for some time and also in in kaya for some time mm -hmm. and i think his uh, inklings were more to do with managing building a family office which is a different business altogether you know mm -hmm. and he has been uh, i mean he's done a very good uh, 
job in building sharp which is our family office investment office in investing in public markets on listed companies and that's what do is also on board of marico so Uh, so i think he wanted to move in that uh, newer business building something of his own rather than following something which i had done you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh a, 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 the head of a global head hunting firm once told me that um, in the indian context the role of a professional ceo in a family run business in india uh, you know it's it's basically two things one uh, to keep the promoter members on the board happy and two get favors from the government <laughs> there is not much more of a role for a professional ceo in a family run company so i think we may be an outlier i don't think that is relevant to to marico it's not to keep a promoter happy it to keep all the stakeholders happy which is due because of good performance you know so if your performance is not good as a professional ceo then you are not keeping anybody happy you know mm-hmm. and luckily in our sector we don't have to go to the government for many clearances and as such the role of government is reduced over a period of time mm-hmm. so not at all relevant from what you heard from somebody else uh, to marico so we need to have a leader who is great performer who looks at all the stakeholders and not just shareholders mm-hmm. what next for harsh marivala you are you are what 70 now Yeah. And uh, how do you how do you intend to spend uh, the rest of your life and your wealth? So, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I'm trying to build uh, the organization from a perpetual point of view. Okay. So, effective board members, uh, managing the company, converting the company from a promoter managed company to a strategic investor driven company, where the board will play a very important role. in driving growth in selecting the right talent uh, in ensuring that the perpetuity is there through values building culture building purpose of the organization so that's as far as marico's concerned and separately i i do a lot of things in terms of giving initiatives so whether it is in the area of mental health which my daughter manages we are um, funding agency we give grants to almost 26 mental health organizations in the country we also i am working on ascent which is our platform for helping entrepreneurs through a peer to peer learning platform so i spend time there my son's office so he manages full time i spend about 10 20 percent of my time on that the writing of the book uh, <laughs> took some time and i am happy that the book has come out quite well and i am sure that the readers will enjoy reading the book uh, it will be much more than what uh, you covered today but i must compliment you for uh, for having very pointed questions and i am sure you have read the whole book <laughs> properly otherwise you would not have been able to get these questions uh, but i am quite busy you know i i keep my eye on board of three of our own internal companies and three external boards i am also on uh, advisor to some private equity funds so net net i have i have a lot lot of things including a lot of media interactions uh, i speak a lot at different uh, company events or some other platforms so It's, uh, it's 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 different compared to what I was doing. In a way, I've reinvented myself, but I'm enjoying it. I'm seeing. Uh, I see that I'm able to add value to all the stakeholders. Okay. Harsh Marivala, thank you very much for joining us, and thank all the best for your new book. Thank you, thank you, Vivek. Bye. Thank you.